just want to uh, begin today asking you a few questions. Um, you raise your hand if you've ever been encouraged by what someone has said to you. By the words someone's said to you, you you've been encouraged. Yeah? Hands up, who, who's been in, so encouraged by what someone said to them, uh, they're... They, they want to do the things that this person's encouraged them to do, but it's still not being visualised in their lives. But you remember those words that were spoken maybe a year ago, five years ago, however long, you remember those words, and it's driving you to achieve good things. So everyone so far. Who's ever been offended by, by what someone has said to them? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, everyone. This is like an exercise class. It's an exercise yeah. <laughs> And it's terrible how those words, those offensive words, can, can change the course of our lives sometimes. Maybe it just completely changes us. We become broken and fragile. Who here, show of hands, has said something offensive to someone? Okay. Who wishes they could take those words back? Okay. So today in, uh, we are going to consider how we use our tongue in light of who we are in Christ. And the sermon title today is The Tongue is Powerful and Inconsistent. Who can tame it? The tongue is powerful and inconsistent. Who can tame it? Can we produce what God desires from our lives using our tongues? Can we produce what God desires from us by using our tongues? So we're in the sixth week in our series in the letter of James. James is Jesus' half-brother. And surprisingly, he wasn't a follower of Jesus in Jesus' earthly ministry. It's recorded in the third chapter of Mark that he was one of those who, who considered that Jesus was out of his mind. But then in, in the letter in, to the church in Corinth, we hear that, that James saw Jesus' resurrected body and from there he believed and he became uh, one of the chief leaders in Jerusalem in the church. From severe doubt to himself calling himself a servant of Christ. That's a great testimony, isn't it? But I guess it's a testimony that many of us have. This is crazy. And then God does a work in them, he draws, them to, draws us to himself transforms us, and yeah, now we're just, yeah, sold out, servant of God. So what's the letter about? Well, it's got many applications, and it reads like a series of mini-sermons. It's like a, a New Testament version of the book of Proverbs. It's straight talking, to the point, and it's not like wearing uh, face masks. No Christian is exempt. With only five chapters, it's a really easy to read, but it's not easy to read at all if you're a Christian. James sets the bar really high, and he calls out Christians who aren't living out their profession of faith. And he highlights inconsistencies in our faith, because faith should bring results. It should lead to action. James uh, famously said, uh, without, without faith, um, without action, our faith is dead. Because what God does, the powerful work he does in salvation uh, in us, truly transforms us. And James said, I don't, I don't know if you have faith, because it doesn't look like you have, because faith results in works. And it's described in letter, a few times, as the first fruits odd term, first fruits. In, uh, in, so I've got the supplement uh, text in, uh, on, on inside your sheets. 
So chapter 1, 18, what does this mean? He chose us to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So either James is referring to how God has uh, brought creation to life by his word, or he's referring to the new birth we have in Christ, that we've been born again, that our identity has completely changed, that we've gone from an enemy of God to a child of God. And then God has caused his spirit to dwell in us. Either way, God wants us to be a first fruit, some kind of first fruit. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's a word throughout the Bible. In Exodus, we read how God commanded the Israelites to bring their first fruits of the harvest to the house of the Lord as an act of sacrifice, obedience, reverence to who God is. The question James raises is that we ought to be a first fruit. We are the first fruit. Will we now do what's considered costly? It's costly to give away the first fruit. Will we too do what's considered costly, sacrificial and obedient to God? Will we ripen? Will we mature? Will we fully develop? A good summary of what this means uh, would be found in Romans 12, that famous verse. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. God desires something from you. And how do we do this? Well, I guess when our life's in order, right? When we've got that nice routine we've all wanted, you know, when we've got everything in order and, you know, got a little Bible study in the morning and everything's looking tickety-boo. No. James says it's through our trials. At the start of the letter, it's a fantastic verse. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of faith produces perseverance. Perseverance, let perseverance. Let perseverance finish the work so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That word mature there is the same word as perfect and it's used throughout the letter. And it means to fully accomplish, to be fully developed, to fully grow, mature, just like the first fruits. So James is saying that we ought to bank our trials as a joy, not because Christians should be good actors and and just pretend that, you know, our, our Christian life should be full of prosperity. No, that we should bank them as trials because it's, it's those times God can develop what God desires from you. The question today is, how can we use our tongue, this little thing here, to bring about what God desires? So... The tongue is powerful and inconsistent. Who can tame it? I have three quick, three quick points to make. Firstly, the tongue is powerful. So, um, so on your sheets, uh, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that who teach, we who teach, will be judged more strictly. James is saying the teacher role shouldn't be taken lightly, shouldn't jump into this one. Teachers of God's word will be judged more strictly. Why? They say more. They practice what they preach. And we know this is true, even though we're not called to judge. We, we know that like, we, we judge Christian leaders. We just do that, right? It doesn't sit right with us when they're not living out what they preach. If, if we saw Alex, bumped into Alex on the, um, at the checkout on the St. George local, cursing the cashier, that, that would really, what? That would really like startle us. But someone else in this church who wasn't a Alex, we're like, <laughs> well, okay. We, we, would, we might want to encourage them, but we wouldn't judge them so much. Quite rightly, we would judge Alex, because Alex should practice what he preaches. There is an evaluation at the end of our lives with God. Have we used what's been given to us 
wisely? Have we, God, have we given God a return? Then verse 2, James says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. James made this point very clearly already, uh, that we all sin. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point, one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So we're all sinners. We all rely on God's grace. As Charlotte uh, very well put it, um, we're all lost sheep. All need of saving. But is it all right then just to kind of stumble around in sin? You know? Is there any goal? Is there any aim? Yeah. The aim is that we should be perfect. How do we do that? Be never at fault in what we say. I love aiming for things. I don't know about you. I, I, I love just, just making games up and just aiming things. I, I used to like just like throw my tea bag in my cup every morning, you know, from, from a greater distance before the kettle like uh, boiled. I love aiming for things. I, I go to the beach and I, uh, I, I I, I, get, I get to the water and I, and I throw one stone up and uh, out to sea and then I throw another one and try and hit that stone. And I do it until I, and I, and I don't leave the beach until I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to give me a lift to the beach? I'll give you a lift there, not a lift back. Okay. <laughs> okay. And from onlookers, it looks crazy. It just looks like, well, he's not going to get it. Then I get it. Let's get closer and closer, just throwing, 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 throwing. I get it. I practice throwing. What am I developing? Perseverance. <laughs> that perseverance, that's what I'm doing. And why do I do it? Well, for fun. It's just for fun, isn't it? Yeah. And why, why should we try to be perfect? Why should we um, limit what we say? Well, Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check. We, that's our, get, that's our goal. Not to be perfect, but to, but to be able to keep our whole body in check. That's, that's what we're aiming for. What a great aim. Are we going to just keep trying? Or just go, oh, I'm just going to stumble. I'm fine with stumbling. We aim at loads of things in life. I'm sure all of you have got aims for next week. You've got aims for today. They might be just, oh, I just need to get, I need to get the shopping done, <laughs> do some washing, and go to sleep early. Well, it's still an aim. Everyone's got, someone's got greater aims. And we strive for them, and we stay up late to do them. Are we striving to try and keep our body in check? If we master our tongue, we master our whole body, James says. The tongue is powerful because even, even though it's small, it's so small, that's a huge part to play in us becoming complete, fully mature, fully developed. Because after all, as soon as someone opens their mouth, you understand who they are. Are we in Christ? Now, now we see that tongue is powerful because it can steer us. So, verse 3. But, but we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, for example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. The tongue is a small organ, right? It's so tiny, but it makes great boasts. It has the ability to kind of just leave humility at the starting line, doesn't it? 
wave goodbye to the truth. What, what do we mean it makes great boasts? Well, how can it steer our direction like a rudder or a ship? How can it steer us? Well, when we boast, we're saying that this is where I've gone. This is where I'm going to go. And James um, makes really good application and advice in, uh, in later on in chapter 4 about boasting. And let me quickly read that to you. It's uh, James 4.13 on these sheets again. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll do this, th this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. It's good to make plans. It's really good to make plans. Else you just react to stuff. It's good to make plans, but make sure those plans are wrapped with submission to God. That he is in control wrapped with humility. So, we can uh, continue our passage uh, in verse 5. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. We've all seen that on the news, haven't we? The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the body parts. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself set on fire by hell. Your tongue is dangerous. Your tongue is so dangerous. My tongue is so dangerous. It can cause devastation. You think of world leaders. A few words here or there, hundreds of thousands of people lose their lives. And you think closer to home. Maybe you can think of or experience in family breakdowns, relationship, friendship breakdowns caused by a few fiery words said at the moment, which has caused and escalated. It's called division and a whole lot of hurt. Do we know what they what was said? No, about five years ago, but they, they said something, and you know, just. Now look at it. It's devastation. Relationships just ripped apart by a few fiery words. The tongue is powerful. It's also untamable. The tongue is also untamable. That's my second point. Verse 7. All kinds of animals birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Mankind has achieved to tame all sorts of creatures to do extraordinary things. And remember, this was written like, just before AD 50, way before SeaWorld and the film Flipper. And the irony is, but even though we have this ability to tame such strong, mighty, powerful animals, we haven't yet been able to tame a small little tongue. That's the irony of it. We've all tried, haven't we? We've all tried to tame the tongue. Maybe it's uh, to go to uh, on a first date or a job interview. And that's really just like, just don't say anything stupid. Just don't reveal who you are right now. <laughs> just, 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 just don't speak. That's be better. <laughs> or we try to do, um, a, you know, like a little swear box, you know. It's funny how no one really continues in the set swear box. No one's like continue that throughout the whole life, have they? It just, it's there for a little bit and it stops. Or maybe it's when you go to a special event with family or close friends. 
Maybe you ha you've been telling people, don't worry, I, I won't say anything. You know there's going to be a disagreement if you do. But we do. <coughs> Just had to say it. Why? The tongue is untamable. In our pursuit for perfection, we all stumble. The tongue is untamable, and it's also inconsistent. And this is what James really wants to make us be aware of. It's inconsistent. This is my third point. Verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Verse 10, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. The tongue is inconsistent. Because with it, we curse and we also praise. <coughs> the tongue is inconsistent. It reminds me of my, uh, my milk frother. It's, um, uh, like it's, it's, it's been fine for a while, but, but now it's just, you know, sometimes it produces this beautiful frothy milk and I have this beautiful coffee in the morning. And sometimes, without any reason whatsoever, same milk just produces warm milk, just like no froth whatsoever. And, it's like, oh, great. and I don't know what I'm going to get until I pour out. We don't know who we're like, who we are, what we're about, until we speak. Nigel Stiles puts it uh, very carefully like this. Uh, if you bump into a sinner, sin gets spilled. If you bump into a sinner, sin gets spilled. And it's really annoying for the owner when things don't <laughs> work as they should. Come on, Nescafe, you're a good brand. Um, anyway. So with our tongue, we praise God. Every time we sing a song of praise, we're redirecting who we are. With our tongue, we can redirect who we are. We sing a song of praise. We're going to sing today after this sermon. We're going to speak well of God. We're going to announce his goodness to us. We're going to announce his, his, his forgiveness to us. That he's saved us. He's, he's saved a wretch like me. And that he's in control. And we're going to announce this and praise this. With our tongues we can be who we were created to be. But on the other hand, we can use our tongues to curse each other. The word curse uh, has been translated from the Greek word, I think you pronounce it, katara. It means two things, curse and imprecation. So curse is much more damning than the way that we normally use it here. Um, it means on whom condemnation falls. Uh, it's a result of himself cursing, God himself cursing, God himself condemns. In Galatians, we, we read, uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. God is in the position to judge, not us. And without Christ taking our condemnation on himself, that condemnation will go on us. But instead of showing that mercy that God has shown us to others, we have the ability to curse. We can want the very worst destination for someone. The word also means imprecation, uh, which is the more common way we use the word curse. It's being rude, insulting people, being angry. Who here has done that? And it's much more than you think. Much worse, so much worse. Why? Because you're cursing people who are made in the image of God. On one hand, we can worship the creator 
and hates his creation. Does it make sense? Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. The tongue is very inconsistent. For example, you could use your tongue today to praise God, sing his praises, and then leave church and insult your partner. Or you could gossip behind someone's back today. You can judge someone. Or you can make great boasts with your friends tomorrow. Just today, you use your tongue to, to praise God, and then that happens. It's just inconsistent. And that's, this is a kind of continuation of the theme that I have found in James while studying it, uh, that when Christians don't act how they ought to, uh, we are double-minded. We, we forget who we are. We forget what we look like. And we deceive ourselves. Then James explains that the rest of God's creation, the rest of God's creation, is consistent with itself. So, verse 11. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Fig trees produce figs. And vine, grapevines produce grapes. It would be unnatural otherwise, wouldn't it? It would be really unnatural. It would be very unpleasing for the farmer, wouldn't it? A servant of God should produce praise, not cursing. But unfortunately, James doesn't actually give us clear advice within the passage that we have allocated today on how our tongue should remain consistent with who we are. Doesn't give us clear advice. Doesn't even say it's possible. <laughs> Great, <laughs> okay. <laughs> encouraging, yeah? Yeah, it's a really encouraging church, yeah. Got a real bad problem, can't, can't solve it. Okay. But James just says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Is that enough for us to think of James, our brother in Christ, saying with a kind of maybe disappointed voice, a caring voice, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. Who can tame the tongue? Who can tame the tongue? We can't, but I believe God can. We're reminded to look at the source, right? Where do we come from? And how do we grow accordingly? And I just want to finish up here in, uh, if we go back to the start of the letter, actually, it gives us really good advice. It gives us practical advice. And it also makes us to look deeper from within and where we come from. So for James chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to come angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so relevant and humble, humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. So produce, so for us to produce the first fruits which God has called us to live out, to, to become, to be fully mature and developed, we have to just take a practical step, slow to speak. Because when we, when we curse, we, um, we're, through, we're in a trial, right? 
That's a trial, right? That's why, that's why we curse. That's why we got angry, because we're on a trial, right? Trials could take many forms, right? But many kinds, many, many sort of kinds, J James says at the start of the letter. It could be with the people you love the most, people you hang around with the most, people you work with. That's when we get angry. So James is taking us, saying a practical advice about that. Be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. Why? Because if you're slow to speak, you'll be slow to become angry. You might not get angry. I don't know if anyone's tested this out, but it actually works. Just limit yourself. Just to be just slower to respond. Just listen. Got two ears, one mouth. Just listen. Don't have to say anything. Why respond? That's practical advice. We also have to have a decision. There's also a decision to make. Do we want to do this? Do we want to aim for something? Do we want to aim? Do you want to get? Do you want to? Do we want to reach it? We have to make a choice to choose to take off the moral filth. Choose to take off the moral filth. It's, it's like, you know, you're taking off a dirty garment. Do we want to do this? Is this something important? Is this important to us? Do we care? Do we want to pursue this and have this aim to uh, keep, have our whole body in check for the glory of God, to produce what God wants for us? Do we want this? Or do we think this is impossible? quite happy to stumble around in sin. We have to choose to do this. And then lastly, much deeper, is that we have to humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. The word Alex has already mentioned in previous sermon, sermons is that the word is to heal you. To restore you to health. Humbly accept the word that can restore you. Jesus puts like this, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need to humbly accept the word of God. Humbly accept Christ as ruler of our hearts so we can bring forth praise in our lips. But it takes a decision, and it takes some practical steps as well. But let us live a life knowing that our tongue can produce this, these first fruits. It can be matured. It's, it is untamable. It's, gonna be, it's, it's, kind of, it's impossible. But it's something to aim for, and um, I believe it's possible. I believe it's possible. I don't think I'm, con uh, I'm saying that what's in contrary to James. I'm saying that we just need to look to the source. We're going to stumble along the way, but along the way, we will hit a few stones. We will get it. And that will bring glory to God.